So, hi, I'm Ivan again. That's my official job title, if I'm correct, but I prefer to uh, refer to myself as the JavaScript person who works remotely. I'm going to try and explain Unicode in five minutes or less. I, I hope that everybody here has a good understanding for Unicode since we are all supposed to be working at, you know, Word Processor, but since this is not really the case, I think I want to start with like a low bar of common knowledge about Unicode, just to make sure that everybody has uh, at least an understanding of how this works. So, I like my name to be written correctly. This is a, something that I like. And my name has these four characters, which are four grapheme clusters. This is kind of weird. I guess that most people uh, know about this thing called ASCII, which uh, is a table of two uh, 256 numbers which map to 256 characters. Unicode is like that. And the important thing to remember here is the code point. A code point is a number from 0 to 1.1 million. And that's what you have to think about where you're thinking it in an abstract way. Then that number is represented or encoded in different ways, such as UTF-16 or UTF-8. But if you're thinking, if you, have a, if you want to make a mental model, you have to work with code points. And then later when you're doing the coding, you worry about the, uh, the encoding. That's one of the very important things. And the weird thing is that you can write my name in several ways uh, with Unicode. Unicode has this thing called combining characters. It's a character that it's not alone by itself, so it combines with either the preceding one or the following one, or there's a whole set of rules. But you can, you can have, uh, in my case, the acute accent or the acute diacritic, you can have it composed with the small Latin letter A. Here you can also see that the combining acute accent has a higher code point number, so it will get encoded in a different way when you're doing bytes, okay? Remember, don't worry about the encoding when you're looking at this thing, worry about the code points, then worry about how each code point gets uh, encoded by a different algorithm. The algorithms are really simple and, and almost trivial. The problem with this is not knowing what you're doing. The, the problem is not putting comments in your code saying, I am using this very specific kind of encoding, UTF-16 Little Endian, or UTF-8, or uh, UTF-32, which is just packing everything in 32 integer fields. The problem is what your code is doing. Your mind should be working only in code points, not in code units, not in bytes. Now, if you're asking yourself, how many combining diacritics can Unicode have on a character? I'm happy you asked me that question. So can you please go on that link? Come on, help me here. Just and write something on the text field. Like, yeah. And that number, we can set it up to, I don't know, up to 11. The three. I said up to 11, not to 15. You're making a mess now. Okay, so you can have a lot of combining characters on any other Unicode character. There's theoretically no limit. You can even put the same combining character twice and it might get displayed or not. You can have all kinds of things. And there's really no reason why you cannot do 15 or 20 or anything. This is also a funny way to get around Twitter limitations on characters because code points are not characters, apparently. So depending on how you count, you will get a different count. That's why it's important to think in code points and then how this is combined into graphemes. Let's go back. Yes. There are a lot of funny things with this. This is an interesting case which I like to show uh, to show to you because this displays sequences, Unicode sequences. Flags, which all we all have on their phones, are actually two characters, each of them with one code point. Those are very high code points. It's like 100,000, so they need to be encoded in more bytes when you think about it. And it's weird because even though they have characters, they combine themselves as a single sequence that cannot be broken down. So I'm going to I'm going to do magic here. Okay, I'm going to try and select these two things. Uh, oh, I want to select this thing here, and then I copy, and then I go to a new tab, and then I go here, and then I paste. Okay, so far so good. Uh, Control plus. Control plus. Where's the plus here? Uh, that's a little keyboard. Okay. Control 
plus? Yeah, control plus. More. More! Okay, do me a favor and hit backspace. Again? Oh my god, what? you've broken it. <laughs> Where are the letters? They're gone. And the worst thing is that the cursor cut it is in the middle of the glyph, which is weird. I can split it if it's in the middle because it's two different code, uh, it's different characters. But if you try to move around with the cursor keys, you cannot split it again. It's a sequence, it's an unbreakable sequence, there's no way around it. it. It's weird, but you should know about this. That's actually one graphene cluster with two characters, with two, uh, two code points, with four UTF-16 code units, with a lot of, um, with a lot of UTF-8 bytes, okay? It's kind of strange to think about this this way, and uh, these kind of sequences are funky in the sense that you can write any amount of uh, regional indicator symbol letters, and uh, the Unicode sequence uh, logic will group them in groups of two as long as there's a flag corresponding to them. So it's kind of weird. Also, something that I haven't told you that it's also important to remember is that not all 1.1 million code points have a character. Most of the code points are reserved for future use. And there's a whole different uh, world of pain when you have missing characters or you don't have the specifications for all the code points that your text or your files are using. And now for the last uh, example, if you can understand this, you have all CJK things solved in your head, okay? This is one graphene cluster with seven characters, which is seven code points, which is a bunch of code units in UTF-16 and a bunch more bytes. There are a lot of things interesting here. You can see that the uh, zero with joiners have this, uh, it's 2000D in hexadecimal, that gets translated to two bytes in UTF-16, but three bytes in UTF-8 wasted in space, and you can kill family members when you delete things, which is crazy. If you understand this, it's really, it's, it's gonna make any Unicode problem easier for you. Also, you have to remember that there's another concept that I haven't uh, put here, which is the glyph. A glyph is the representation of a grapheme in different typeface. So, for example, an A is not the same in uh, Times New Roman or Digivu Sans or Comic Sans. The A is different glyph for the same grapheme, for the same character, for the same code point, for the same representation. I hope to have broken your brains a tiny little bit with Unicode, and I hope you have a basic understanding of how it works. Thank you. Okay, um, basically we have um um, I'm still the wiki guy and I am try to import old stuff from other wikis and yeah, open it in Nextcloud. <laughs> and um, yeah, Nextcloud is uh, the presentation. You got, I shared it with you. Yes, uh, great. Um, and basically, that, uh, finally, at that conference, I was able to import stuff, or better saying, we started to import um, 150,000 pages uh, in a completely new wiki, and um, the import is still working. Uh, the great part is we do fix um, stuff which another project cannot fix somehow. Hmm? Um, ich hab's dir an, yeah. ich hab's einfach mit einem Benutzer geteilt. Oder gehen Telegram rein, da ist es, hab ich's dir auch hingeschickt. <lacht> Thorsten lost my li slides. Ah, So basically, Wi-Fi is cool. Um, uh, I I was doing the slides in that room actually because I got um, got it. F um, no, go to go to the first slide. Um, and we 
I was searching for a great name. So basically I said, that's the document foundation ethic, but editable. <laughs> Some might get the hint. Um, next slide. <laughs> So, yeah, that's um, still that's a, a screenshot f from half an hour ago. They know what they have to fix. Um, it's rather easy, but um, since over a year, they didn't fix it. So, um, the, the problem is we have pages which do not work. The registration is not um, um, activated, so uh, you cannot change the content itself if you don't have any uh, account. And um, more or less, we do want to keep the content updated, uh, up to date, sorry. So, next slide. So, um, and we get regular requests to our mailing lists, to some other mailing lists um, that some pages do not work. And um, we try to, get around that with archive.org, but we have a better solution. Next slide. <laughs> As I said, the attic. So basically we have uh, working or non-working links, depends, and we have, um, after the import is finished and um, provided for the general audience, um, some easy work. Uh, you simply have to modify the URL to access the content. So. Next slide. <laughs> um, here it's a screenshot also a few minutes ago, uh, and you see the templates are still not imported, basically because it's um, a really long one, and, but that is the same uh, page which was, oh, I see. Um, it's basically the same page which was not working at the moment for the other project. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so for the future, we simply have waiting the, um, uh, that the import is finishing. Um, we have to import the files and simply remove the database to the production server because it's all one on the test machine. And in the end, you can still again uh, get access to old non-functional working links. Yeah. So basically, that was my time at the conference. <laughs> um, yeah. Any questions? Good. Yeah, maybe one from me. So first of all, this is absolutely awesome. I mean, there's uh, it's really a number of, it's not only this one single wiki, there's a number of other wikis. Yeah. Um, and, and you're working on all of them, um, one by one, or? Yeah, um, the, the plan is to import the Turkish LibreOffice wiki so they can finally uh, shut down the old server, and which is unman unmaintained until now. And um, afterwards, we have um, a static HTML uh, wiki pages, um, from the German community, which should get uh, imported afterwards. Um, and again, to get it editable, um, the German community is requesting it since a few years, actually. And yes, uh, so in the end, if you know other wiki content, even if it's not any longer accessible to the um, internet, we might get fi find it, uh, the content in the archive orgs um, archives <laughs> uh, on the way back machine and we can do fix uh, make this stuff again um, editable so if you know other great resources send it to me Yes, of course. If, um, it's basically a um, one-time job, and uh, we, we can do it. If it's a media wiki, it's a no-brainer. But it doesn't matter if there are um, converters or some other ways to get around that. 
For example, the, um, the German HTML archive of that Moin Moin wiki um, is converted with some regex plus uh, the LibreOffice um, HTML importer and MediaWiki exporter. And it produces rather good results, whoever wrote it. Thank you for him. <laughs> Cisco? Depends on the workload of Gulem. <laughs> or maybe how much sleep you need next week. Uh, we will see. Depends on the beers and not sleeping. <laughs> Thanks. So I'm guessing um, most of these would be familiar to most um, here, but the hope is that you'll find one or two things um, that are new. So I don't go anywhere without these tips, and I hope you will also keep them close to you. So first tip is, is use a decent debugger. Um, it doesn't have emojis, I'm sorry. Um, it, it doesn't do animations, right? Um, but um, it will make your life so much easier. Um, just learn the commands. And I have some very good ones. So the first one is always, always have logging on. Um, reproducing um, stack traces, figuring out um, uh, uh, how the code works for certain cases, the ability to go back and, and, and see um, what you've done in the last debug session to grab the logs of your interactive um, debugging is just invaluable. The fact that you can actually um, grab function names and file names and find clues um, that will help you figure out a bug without running the debugger is, is fantastic. It will save you at least half your time. Always keep it on. Make sure you have a path that you have um, access to it. If you run GDB under um, super user, remember that the file uh, itself is going to have uh, been written by the super user, so you won't be able to, to log to the same file if you run it under your own username. You can use echo um, during a debug session to um, add hints. Um, like what you were debugging or what you were doing or anything like that because this is going to be one continuous file and you don't want um, to lose track. Um, this is how you do a breakpoint. You just do break or you do B and a function name or a file line. But you can actually add conditionals. Like at the bottom, I'm actually calling it a C function. And you can call any function. Um, you can compare integers. You can compare values. You can, you can pretty much do anything. And with conditionals, you don't have to break every time, read the value, and then decide to continue until you hit your, the value you're looking for. Just, just add the, the conditional. It will save you time. Um, this one is, is the most amazing one. Um, uh, people traditionally print out values as a way of debugging. You really don't need to do that. You, you, you edit the code, you compile the code, you run the code, then you, you have to read the, the output. Doesn't make sense. Just run the debugger, um, uh, put the breakpoint, which we did just uh, in the previous slide. It, the GDB will tell you the uh, number, the index, uh, the ID of the breakpoint. You use that as N here. Uh, you write command, N is the number of breakpoint, and then you can actually write any script you want in, in the GDB command. So here what I'm doing is I'm printing the value of a variable, and then I print the stack trace, nine of them only, nine deep, and then I continue. Uh, and you run this um, on any point of interest, and then you actually get exactly what you would, um, but even better with the stack trace, had you added, you know, std c out or printf or even logging, right? And you can, you can put anything here and then the output, you grab it or you read it um, before sleeping or whatever you like to do with it. Um, next is this. Who, who knows what this does? Any, any show of hands, who knows what this is? Okay, seriously, you can't raise your hand. Don't, I mean, I'm, I don't have candies, but... Okay, this is a breakpoint. And the R is regex. Is that, is that a good hint? So you use this, 
if you know that whatever you're looking for, you have no clue which function it ends up in, right? You, but you do know which class is probably responsible for it. And you might even know a, a part of the function, like if you have a bunch of functions that handle events or a bunch of functions that, that do something, you, you can actually write a regex that would break on all the matching functions. You, you, can, you can configure it however you want, but this is the most obvious one. I know it's going to hit um, the view shell at some point, or I know it's going to hit the SW format or the SW undo or whatever it might be, but I just don't know which function it's going to be and you do this, and then you, you're able to read the log again if you, if you continue um, or, or with commands, you can continue the breakpoints, you will be able to see w w where um, you're crossing paths. Um, this one is a fantastic one because typically what happens is in a debug session, what you do is you add breakpoints as you go because you figure, oh, it's, I probably need to also stop here. And then at the end, you have these breakpoints and you, you need to close the session and restart or whatever, um, and you, you will lose them. That's, that's a bummer, really. Uh, no, you save, save breakpoints, give it a file name. It's gonna save all the breakpoints. In fact, the disabled one will be saved as disabled, enabled ones enabled, and then you can edit them, you can add more, right? Because it's going to be the commands that you know about. It's gonna be B, the file name or the function name, um, etc. and the condition if there was one, and you can edit it, you can add more, and then you source it the next time you restart GDB, and you just continue where you left off. Okay. Who knows what this does? Show of hands again. Anyone? Anyone? Yes, yes. The other one is the text uh, user interface. Yes, T TUI. So TUI actually will, will split the screen to you. One, the first one, um, is going to give you one screen uh, above and the bottom is going to be your command and the top is going to be the source code. In fact, uh, the up and down arrows will scroll the text in the code Right? So you can actually see, you don't need to do L, 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 you uh, know, you just scroll. Um, and if you want, you can do Control X2, and that will split it even two ways, and then you get uh, the assembly. Um, and then you can actually um, um, uh, go through them, um, and you can maximize any one you want. And at the bottom, you still have your command. Uh, but now, to go to the previous and next commands, you need to use Control N and Control P because the arrows scroll your code. Um, Control XA will toggle this TUI on and off, so you can go back and forth. Okay. Um, LLDB is the um, LLVM version um, of GDB. Essentially, it's their debugger. Um, and you want to use this because it is so much faster. It will, it will, it will attach to LibreOffice probably two times faster depending on the weather. Um, and it, it has a few commands that are different, but it's, it's worth using it um, if you really need to do a quick one, right? Um, GDB is, is, is significantly slower than this guy. And that's it. I think I have a few seconds for questions or for silence. All right, thank you. Oh, 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 hold it, yes, go. I have a question, are you going to put it in the wiki? I'm going to help. Uh, send me the link, I'll, I'll copy no, paste. It's, it's not the wiki page. Like, if you add it there, because we are all I don't, I don't have it anywhere. I, I didn't know it was useful to anyone else, I don't know. <laughs> yes, Michael. So you had to use GDP in it, and what do you have in it? Uh, yes, I do. I have the logging, um, and I have uh, actually I have a few macros where where I, one one command will give me the frame and local variable printout. Yes, I can share it. Thank you. So please, someone take a picture for my Facebook. <laughs> uh, someone, not not all. So. I'd like to talk about uh, uh, how to find a bad synonyms in trans translation, Japanese translation. Uh, I'm Koji Anora. Uh, this is agenda uh, about me and the characters and the PO files to graph database and uh, graph view and what's next. About me. 
Uh, I'm from uh, uh, south of Japan, uh, Fukuoka. Do you know Kyushu Island? No? Oh, thank you. And uh, uh, so, so uh, most famous uh, pork taste ramen noodle. About me, uh, I am a, 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 a one of the founders of New4j user group Tokyo, um, and a member of LibreOffice Japanese team. And, so, well, I like coffee, so I like some certificate. So, um, I booked my uh, my uh, air, my air, so I received next day uh, this this mail. Oh, your talk was not accepted. Wow! Oh my God! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I love uh, LibreOffice, so I. I hope to go on. Uh, I hope to join here. Um, Japanese four types of ja uh, characters in Japanese. Um, this is example. Uh, no. Uh, in Japan, what watashi no smaho wa iPhone des. My smartphone is an iPhone. Uh, four. Types of characters: a Chinese character, uh, a kanji, watashi is kanji, is a hiragana is no and des, and katakana smart smaho, and smartphone, and the English uh, alphabet. So, a many co complicated language. Uh, so what changed with the times? Computer, an old one, uh, Densuke-san, uh, to uh, current, uh, uh, now, now we use a computer, this one, I think. Before 2008, this one. So, and the graph database is uh, all Japanese are, are correct. Um, so I want to find out, find out synonyms in Japanese translation of uh, LibreOffice. How? I hope to find. I hope to find something by graph database. I think. So this is, I think, I thought of the pattern. This is word. Um, yellow is English word. Is one English word is one Japanese word. Uh, a sentence is green. Sentence uses word. This Japanese sentence uses, uses word. The square pattern is, is correct, I think. So, I watched the inside of my PO, uh, of PO file. I like this one. Uh, English document, a Japanese document. And this is, this is word. This is sentence, uh, document background. This is sentence, sentence and word. So, I um, PO file to CSV by, by my program, PO2, CSV, Python, and into a graph database, like this one. This is a, a word and a sentence graph in the PO file. Uh, this is an English document, 
uh, document word. Uh, these green uh, sentences, sentences use it, uses the word document. Red, uh, red one is a Japanese document. So you will see uh, uh, some, some strange graph pattern. This is connected. Connected uh, this sentence, uh, English sentence, connected to a uh, Japanese sentence. But it's, these are not connected. Maybe uh, uh, this area is a good translation, I think. So um, I search for uh, sentences that do not use the same word. So I search the uh, Japanese translation of the word document. I found uh, three different Japanese translation. Uh, this is Japanese bunsho. It's a I mean a document. Uh, this is a uh, katakana. This is a document. One, three different Japanese translators. One, two, three. Three. Third is uh, no no document here in in Japanese. So um, for a make good translations, uh, I check synonyms and make good translations. If you unify to bunsho, a Japanese document to bunsho, unify. All document to a uh, bunsho is not good, I think. Uh, if you unify to document, old um, bunsho to a document is, I think, it's so good. Okay, so, so uh, Japanese team think about uh, a select a word in this bunsho or document or something. And what's next? Uh, I really I'm really uh, interested in uh, other countries' language. So, um, Chinese or Korean or uh, uh, someone, uh, you get, get uh, more same trouble, more same uh, same trouble. So uh, you will uh, add uh, this area. How, how about, uh, I don't know, how about uh, uh, Germ Germany? I don't, translation is a no, no problem. So, so, I don't know. Oh, this is the last slide. So, please vote for my CFP at Livocon 2020. Yeah, please. Uh, please, board member. And, and please ask me, uh, this is my name. Uh, 
skoji at anola.com. Please email me. Thank you. Who does remember what the title of my talk was? Huh? The one that I cancelled. Reproducible builds. Right. So, re reproducible builds in LibreOffice. We didn't do them because we always said, ha, 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 that's too hard. Because, well, we are depending, like if we look at all the Linux packages and stuff, we are all up here, and there are a bazillion packages below us that are all not reproducible, so we can't possibly do reproducible builds. Well, then... Um, that looks Spanish. That still looks Spanish. But this this looks English. And among other things, it says that Debian is by now 91% reproducible buildable. That's awesome, Debian. Can we give a round of applause for Debian? <laughs> the un inconvenient truth about this is we don't have our excuse anymore. We might actually start thinking about doing LibreOffice to be uh, a reproducible, build buildable software. And actually, you can see here uh, in the next sentences, right after the stuff that I marked, why this might be a good idea. All right. So, anyone volunteering to help me, maybe looking into this? Is giving you moral support enough? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will do that for you. So I sign up for moral support then. Also, uh, I will volunteer as a visionary for this project. <laughs> okay, any questions? So, so the, the, um, not really questions, just cheering you on. I mean, I think it's really, I mean, this is one of the things, like the, this missing gap from, from, with the open source promise that really, you really don't know what's in the binaries unless it's reproducible. And it looks like not much is missing there. I mean, all the heavy lifting has been done. Yeah, and then we can also build on a Google Cloud that we don't trust, on an Amazon Cloud that we don't trust, and on a Microsoft Cloud that we don't trust, and in the end might be somewhat still trusting the end result, which might be nice. So the question is, how does that work with uh, uh, all the stuff that release engineering does and uh, certification and so on? Uh, I think we should worry about that once we have a reproducible build. Uh, the, uh, oh, so, so I, since we have a lot of time, I will walk over to you very very slowly. It's not that we absolutely need to spend all the time. We can also have the closing session a bit earlier. So, so at Debian we had the same problem with the kernel because the kernel is signed for a secure boot. Uh, but of course the signing infrastructure is not in the hand of developers or the build bots and so on. Uh, so what happened is that what the package that's actually uploaded has, um, is lacking the signing information, and then this is stamped on by the signing mechanism infrastructure. Uh, but you can, you can so the, the final package is not reproducible in that sense, but you can sti still uh, remove the, uh, like the, the stamp, I mean the secure boot part, and you can verify the reproducibility of your package. So I guess that's, that would be something similar that you would need to do. Yeah, also as, um, as a starting point, I mean, uh, how do you start? I, I don't know if you know this uh, image 
uh, or this, me this meme where, where a developer says, oh yeah, but it works on my machine. I think you all have heard this uh, excuse before. And the solution to this was, uh, is, is a software called Docker, which is shipping your machine. And um, that would be a starting point. So if we build LibreOffice inside a Docker image and actually get that reproducible, that would be a start. Then we can move on from there to uh, uh, getting, getting it uh, reproducible outside and so on. Uh, I, think, I, I think it might be easier also to start with Linux and not start with Windows, uh, although Windows probably is, um, is a juicier target in the end. Does anybody know what's the story on Windows? So my, my, my hunch would be there's nothing and you start from scratch, or is there anybody doing any, any work there? Yeah, so my, my hunch would be you start from scratch with all third libraries and if you work up the stack. Um, so, who's heard of 3D plastic printers? I guess you all have by now. But either way, there's a great open sourcey project. And, uh, you know, we fixed the uh, virtual reality world, so why don't we fix the real world as well? So it's all made with open source, right? Um, so RepRap prints itself, um, which is fantastic. You, you don't need anything. You can just print one. Um, but you need the first one. Yeah, so how do you make the first one to print the second one that prints the third one? And so on. Um, and, and how do you control it? It's, it's pretty nasty. So, so here's how you print the first one. Um, you get some bits of uh, hardware of this kind, and um, you assemble them in a sort of fairly rigid frame uh, like this uh, with, with bits of random electronics. The electronics is easy. You have to buy that. Sadly, thus far, it, it doesn't print it. And you have this, this z-axis that goes up and down, and you have some x and y axes, and you move away a little, around a little nozzle that, that, that pushes plastic through itself, gets hot, you know, a bit of PIR control, thermistor, good stuff like this. And uh, you use these lovely timing belts here, which are made for your car. Um, if, if the timing goes wrong in your car, the piston comes up and it hits the valve going down, and you have this amazing noise, and uh, you don't have a car anymore. Um, and so timing belts are very good for not stretching, you know, so they've got this nice steel wire inside. They're very, very precise. And so it's pretty good. It's great for driving nozzles. But gears are difficult, and particularly when you're making them out of, well, nothing, nothing very much. It turns out the ideal thing here is to get your sweetheart's chopping uh, board and to cut a bit off the end of it with a saw like this. And your printer is nice and accurate, and it even you know, is, is the same in both dimensions, like X and Y. You know, it doesn't scale stuff crazily. So you can print your gear out, and you can uh, make, make them like this that go on your, your steppers, um, with some expert help, obviously. Um, this was a while ago. And, and then you can print your beer bottle opener, if it so pleases you, or a, a coat hanger, a, a very a bad one. Notice the, the stringing. This is what happens if you carry on printing and plastic keeps coming out as you move, uh, which, is, which is not uh, ideal. Um, so then, having, having made the very bad uh, wooden plastic printer, you can make the slightly less bad plastic uh, plastic printer. Of course, you'll notice there's a lot of metal in it. And there's a lot of cheating going on. You know, there's, the self-printing is all very well, but you have to tighten all these bolts up and, and stuff, uh, which, which is a bit of a pain. Um, so you print this thing, and there's lots of little fixings and little bits of ABS, and there's hideous warping problems, because as the plastic cools, it moves up, and the whole thing tends to go pop off whatever you're printing it on, and so on. But eventually, you can end up with, uh, with something like that, and uh, you, know, you can uh, get rid of the rather bad uh, physical, mechanical design uh, issues in the, in the first design, and, and you can actually make something that really you know, reasonably prints PLA, bioplastic. So for you recycling fanatics out there, this is the good plastic, you know. It's made out of massively uh, industrialized uh, sweet corn production in America, you know, that's uh, all done with uh, anti God knows what, uh, fertilizers and so on. Um, but anyway, it's, it's biological, so it must be good. And in theory, it biodegrades, although I've never noticed it biodegrade. Uh, it, it seems incredibly tough. And uh, you get lots of better quality as well, so you can, you can print gears and things that work well, plausibly, um, which, is, which is fun. And then once you printed that second one that's not terribly wonderful, then you can print another one um, which is significantly better designed. So, so the nice thing about software, of course, is you can upgrade it and you can cost engineer and engineer your, your, your 3D printer so there is much less of it there because um, stuff is expensive. You know? So get the stuff out of the printer 
And, uh, and it's just quite encouraging to see the generations of, you know, here was a very complicated block in the previous generation. So if you look at this, this guy here keeps the x-axis from going in the wrong direction. It lines it up. It's all part of the calibration. But here we've got two blocks. We've got two uh, nuts, two bolts, four washers. It's a pain to print and a pain to assemble. And you then need to align it with these nuts on the left and right. So it's just lined up. Turns out, in this guy, you can do the same thing with a tiny strap of PLA that does exactly as well and is instant to print, which is kind of cool. Uh, similarly, the electronics, you know, this is the first generation rep wrap something or other from some wonderful people. MakerBot, I think, made these back in the day. Complicated. Extruder controllers, wires everywhere, God knows what. And now, uh, with a simple Arduino and a, a shield, what they call a shield, this thing pops on the top, you can control. Well, all sorts of things, much, much more elegant and attractive. Although a bit annoying, you can only control four, uh, four things. So yes, um, so, so the, the reason I gave this talk some years ago was that I was encouraging people to uh, write less lame software and not in Java. So I mean, I, I don't know, that's, that's my ulterior evil motive. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the software is written in Java, and um, I'm sure Java performs really well and is a wonderful cross-platform language, but um, it's, it's written by uh, mechanical engineers. And uh, you can imagine, actually, computer software engineers tend to write terrible software as well. Uh, well, compu c computer scientists, when you see academic computer science code, they've never tried engineering or maintaining anything. You know, it's all just uh, awful. Um, but apart from Donald Knuth, let's say. Okay, this is, this is the Knuth exception, perhaps. But uh, either way, uh, r there's some fun problems in, in the software as well. So you basically end up with an STL file, which is, you know, there's no real standardization of any goodness in, in this world that I could see. Um, so this is just a whole load of triangles, random lists of triangles uh, in random orders, which you then assemble. Uh, and then you try and slice it, you chop it in half, see what intersects, and work out where to draw little lines of uh, plastic inside, which is a fun problem in itself. Um, particularly since as you do it, you know, there's all sorts of thermal effects and shrinking, and you know, it's nice to do the outside before you color the middle in or you get leakage, and yeah, anyway. And then you uh, get the G-code, which is another disaster area from the, the mechanical control industry, which is like a, a, a multi-dimensional you know, multi axis control language with interpolation and stuff. And you send that down a serial port and out pops something that's the wrong shape um, quite a lot. But it's, it's good fun. Um, so yeah, so your software love is required if anyone's interested. Do you tell me? This was the Great White Hope uh, 10 years ago, um, but it turns out that the insoluble problem for printing metal is that if you have a molten metal and you run it through a very small nozzle, which is what you need to make a wire, it melts the nozzle. Even though the nozzle is like titanium coated and has in theory a very high melting point, uh, just squeezing at pressure, uh, you know, low temperature alloys like this tin bismuth indium uh, through it, uh, is enough to dissolve your nozzle, which, which kind of sucks. And so, so conductivity is, you know, we want something to print the electronics to make, you know, robots and things self-assemble themselves. You know, that, well, I don't know if we want that, but anyway, it seems, like a, it seems like one of those stupid ideas that no one would ever do, but it's kind of an interesting technical challenge. So we should do it. Um, and uh, yeah, that never really happened, really. So they have all these silver conductive inks. So if you're a millionaire, you could probably use gold conductive inks, and they might work well. Um, but it's kind of hard to print bulk electronics. So that was my talk. Hopefully it was interesting and filled a little gap. Thank you.